So some foresighted countries are using climate action as a magnet for investment, and I quote South Korea on that, which is now a regional leader in climate change, having established a global green growth institute to help other countries with their emissions. So a final, uh, just a final generality before I move to Cancun and Copenhagen, is that uh, some of you may also know that deforestation is uh, results in 18% of global emissions. That's more than the entire transport sector, aeroplanes, cars, and ships combined. 18% of global emissions from chopping down forests. The, uh, the latest set of agreements have actually produced uh, an agreement to help preserve forests. And when The Economist comes out and says that forests are the lungs of the planet, you know it's safe to talk in terms of um, the value of forests without being regarded as a suspicious tree hacker. Um, so Brazil is now a world leader on reduction in deforestation. We're working very closely with Indonesia. I can see their Indonesian colleagues in the room. Uh, on, forest, uh, on forest carbon resources. And all of these add up to potentially very significant emissions reduction. I like to think of this as having been quite an interesting paradigm shift in which forests are potentially more valuable alive than dead. Now, um, in terms of understanding what other countries are doing to the effect that it drives Australia's, well, encourages and motivates Australia to and not be as what Mr. Professor Garner has called a drag on international action and climate change. We're very busy working with other countries bilaterally to understand what they're doing. We help China to monitor and record its emissions. We work with Indonesia to preserve and improve its forests. And we work with the major economies forum, which is the 20 largest emitters. We work quite closely with them to try and come up with uh, solutions uh, to this potential global agreement. And finally, we don't give up on multilateralism, which of course is the promised land of the global agreement. And we work with 193 other countries in the UNFCCC. And anyone who's had any involvement with those negotiations, Copenhagen, Cancun, and the 10 or so that went before them, will know that they're very tough. They're not a smooth, linear trajectory. They, uh, they go forward and backwards in quite angry fits and starts. And with all multilateralism, it's only the sum of what you can get agreement to and verify at any given time. This is certainly true too of um, negotiations on arms control and weapons of mass destruction. You can only get what you can get everybody to agree to and be prepared to verify. So it's a matter of seizing the day. And sometimes you just have to go home disappointed. But this year, we didn't. The summit at Copenhagen in 2009, even though it was far from the failure that the press talked it up to be, it didn't deliver all we wanted, or all it might have even been possible to in that year. It just had some fatal flaws. But it did set us up for the set of agreements that we got in Cancun. Cancun, to almost to the same extent that Copenhagen was overreported as a disaster, Cancun has been underreported as a success. And I think what we have from Cancun are a set of building blocks that really does address the willingness of the world's major emitters, and they are China, US, South Africa, Brazil, uh, Indonesia. They're these great big emerging economies, with of course the EU, which is already in, and the US. It, it finds a way for those particular countries to be part of a global emissions reduction regime, and that's not nothing. So, I think it's probably worth having a, a look at um, a closer look at what drives those kind of international multilateral negotiations. And if we start with Copenhagen, if you had to characterise Copenhagen, uh, you would say that it was dominated by the extreme ends of the global geopolitical debate. You had those countries, China, India, and Brazil in particular, coming out of the global financial crisis, really, uh, really feeling much empowered and strong and uh, very, very unwilling, wanting to flex muscle, but very unwilling to do the sort of burden sharing that we in Western countries expect of big economies. So they came out quite stridently, uh, putting their point of view that they would not submit to a global regime, they would not have their actions scrutinized, and they wouldn't be part of anything that was treated in similar terms as the other big Western countries. So you had this very strident, deeply polarized debate 
and it was expressed in an almost sort of old-fashioned Cold War terms when those countries used proxies, quite unlovely proxies, um, the Latin neo-Marxists, Sudan, countries that have no real stake in climate endeavour, and they use them as proxies to prevent and block agreement. So this was a horrible spectacle to witness, particularly after the Danes had put in what really was an absolutely outstanding and generous and strategic and inclusive um, pattern of behaviour over several years to get there. So to see this strident bipolar world was, was pretty awful. What did come out of it was a set of agreements that did shift the paradigm called the Copenhagen Accord, in which a number of countries, not all, uh, put down what they would do in terms of emissions reductions. The trouble was that not everybody agreed to it, and those countries that weren't in the room, and I would say that some of you will remember that our then Prime Minister Kevin Rudd was in the room and was very influential in all of this. Um, the countries that were not in the room spent last year white hunting this agreement and treating it as a sort of set of rogue agreements with nothing whatever to do with the UN. <coughs> Terrible behaviour. But anyway, that's what we had to put up with last year. So if you if you think of that as being uh, Copenhagen, then Cancun was in fact very, very different. And I just list sort of four or five things that made Cancun different and then talk to them a little. And I think one of, Mexico, you will, you will know that Mexico led uh, efforts last year, all the way through the year, culminating in that um, conference of parties in Mexico at the end. And I think if you, it's as, as simple in the first instance as the chemistry. Chemistry was different. The geopolitical positioning and genuine domestic and multilateral strength of Mexico was also extremely important in all of this. We had a rise of the moderates in the middle between those bipolar parties and we had a willingness of those big emerging economies, we call them the basics, to work with the rest of the world. We had a very clunky Japanese announcement that some of you will know about. And I think at the end of the day, we actually just had some old fashioned serendipity thrown in. Just some really good luck and some good, just some things that were characteristic of Mexico that helped along. And what we got out of it was what we call the balanced package. And I just want to go through those things one by one because I think it goes to the point that this stuff is unpredictable and it shows why you have to keep on working at it even when it's thankless because at some moments there's just a, there's just a moment in time when the serendipity is there and you've got to grab it. So to start with Mexico, their team, Calderon at the top, Espinosa foreign minister, 30 years of foreign policy experience, a team, an envoy, Luis Alfonso, who travelled the world constantly, hearing opinions, understanding bottom lines. Um, they were, I think of Mexico as quite bloody-minded multilateralists. Like a lot of the Latin countries, they found multilateral, the UN endeavours, very successful for them over time. They've been able to express themselves politically, economically, developmentally, uh, uh, very well in that context. And so they're very skilled. Brazil is too, Colombia is too. It's a sort of Latin characteristic. They speak English, they speak Spanish, they're very likeable, they're outgoing, and they're very hard-nosed and bloody-minded. So the Mexicans, Great multilateralist. Calderon, totally committed. Um, then you had where they positioned themselves in the world. One foot in the OECD, developed economy, understand the OECD, the top, the top emitted countries in the world, the West, and they understood their bottom lines on mitigation. They also live in Latin America. They also used to be in the G77 quite recently, so they understand where developing countries are in all of this. Next door, they have the world's spoilers, the neo-Marxists, uh, who are just absolutely impenetrable for the rest of us. You know, the EU will just be brushed off by the neo-Marxists. This is Bolivia, Venezuela, Nicaragua. Uh, these countries have very singular, very driven Marxist views of the kind which we don't even hear, really, anymore in this part of the world. <coughs> Australia and New Zealand would be eaten for lunch. I can tell you, we have no influence. But the Mexicans live next door. They visited them all year. They said, tell us your feelings, tell us your concerns. Say everything you like now, but don't even think of raining on our parade. Now, I can't think of another country that could have said that in that part of the world and got away with it, but the Mexicans did. And then um, they did very clever things at the conference. They matched key ministers with key subject areas. Our own Minister Combe went to this meeting somewhat um, somewhat sceptical of what potential outcomes could be. But Calderon put him in charge of the discussion on finance, along with the Bangladeshi minister. And this proved to be, again, a serendipitous kind of uh, combination. And between the two of them, 
they got through this finance work extremely well. And there were other ministers, Norway on forests, you know, and this, this went across the board. The Mexicans were very clever on who they put in charge of what. And again, they built up this very intimate understanding of what countries' bottom lines were. And at the end, when Patricia Espinosa slammed down this text, take it or leave it, to multiple standing ovations, it was because they answered the really deep resident needs of countries politically and economically so that they were each able to agree. We say in multilateral work that nothing it can be agreed until everybody is equally unhappy. But I think in this case it was better than that. I think there were lots of countries who were extremely happy with the way that they sorted it out. Now, second thing was the rise of the moderates. And I'd like to take a little bit of credit for this, and as an Australian government official, we helped, we helped build a group called the Cartagena Group. We decided after Copenhagen that these howling voices of the big dominant countries just wasn't helpful for the rest of us. And we went around and spoke to Colombia and Chile and Thailand and Papua New Guinea and you know, Samoa and uh, you know, half the Caribbean and said, wouldn't you like to be heard more? And they said, yes, we get sick of being howled down. And so we arranged for several sort of meetings throughout the year for these countries to talk together about their policy positions and how they might take them forward. And what we saw in Cancun was instead of a great deafening silence from the middle, we heard from all these countries, South Korea, UAE, Colombia, all of these countries that overwhelmingly wanted global climate action and could only see their futures in terms of sinking, you know, islands in fact, if they couldn't get something sensible and they didn't want their futures to be completely coerced by these um, extreme geopolitical trends. And so we had wonderful, wonderful heartfelt speeches from the Maldives and others. And at the end of the day, that was what carried um, Espinosa through. And it was quite a marvellous piece of the sort of diplomacy that foreign ministers, for as long as I've been in the foreign ministry, which is since 1985, we always talk about progressive middle power diplomacy and creative middle power diplomacy. And I can honestly tell you that's what it was. And it was very gratifying to see it work. Five minutes. <laughs> what? Five minutes? Okay, I'll do this very fast. Uh, we had um, China, shocked by the bad press it had got in the past and determined to be part of the solution. Similarly, India, which came up with a policy that unlocked US engagement. <coughs> Japan told the world it wasn't going to sign up to a second commitment period under Kyoto, so everyone got a big fright and suddenly started to take it seriously. And then under serendipity, I would say the weather. For those of you who might have been in Copenhagen, uh, it was a very large conference centre. There were thousands and thousands of people. The food ran out at six in the afternoon. The smokers had to go outside in the blizzards to smoke. They were People were cold, tired, miserable, and frequently hungry. Anyone who's run a family knows you don't do, you know, you don't do um, controversial things under those conditions. The Mexicans kept us... <laughs> the smokers were outside in the sun. The, uh, the, we were all in a sort of school calf environment with great vats of pork and beans at every turn. People were warm, they had enough to eat, they could go outside for the smoke, and the Mexicans kept plopping down great big bottles of tequila on the table, and they said, this is a party-driven process, the parties need it. So I'd say that was a pretty <laughs> striking definition of beyond a blizzard. Um, <laughs> so in the end, everybody agreed to this balanced package, except Bolivia, and frankly, who cares? I certainly don't. Now, um, I, had, I put that balanced package up there. We got all countries to... Why this is balanced is it has something for everybody. Mitigation and transparency really, really mattered to developed countries, the EU, US, the likes of us, that everybody would reduce their emissions, not just the former Annex 1 countries. The developing countries wanted finance, technology, and help on adaptation. They got that. And the atmosphere got the forests, which is red plus. So it's something for everyone. Developed countries, developing countries, and something, a free kick for the atmosphere. This is fantastic. You have no idea how difficult that was. Anyway, going ahead, next year, or this year, it's Durban. I don't know that we'll get the same sort of wonderful serendipitous outcome, but we will take those building blocks forward. And the overarching goal over time is to get a global agreement that includes all the world's major emitters in the way that they are able to do it. And I think at last we're on track for that. So thank you.